So let's take a trip, or maybe not. Now, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because I think probably you've come to realize by now with some of the stories I've talked about throughout the course that I traveled quite a bit with my mother. Uh, as you know, she had early onset Alzheimer's. And another little factoid is in my first life, I was a flight attendant for 10 years for United Airlines. So who better to talk about travel with you than someone who had a mother with dementia and former flight attendant. So let's get started. First off, when your loved one has dementia or Alzheimer's, it doesn't mean that they can't travel with you any longer. In fact, in the early stages, it can be quite delightful. Now, in the middle stages, it tends to get a little bit more difficult and complicated, but it still can be done. You want to evaluate the stage of dementia and the limitations that your loved one has before making a decision to travel. So let's jump into some signs that it's certainly not safe for you to travel with your loved one. If your loved one is frequently confused or easily disoriented, it's probably not a good idea. They're sensitive to loud environments. Or if they have a tendency to be physically or verbally aggressive, you certainly don't want to consider taking a trip. Or if they're always wanting to go home during short outings. If your loved one tends to wander, might not be a good idea to travel with them. If they have trouble with incontinence, and if they're at high risk for falls. Now, also, late stage dementia is not recommended for travel. It can be very difficult for both you and your loved one and very stressful. So five things to consider when planning a trip out. So you wanna, like I said earlier, you wanna assess your loved one's symptoms, stages, and abilities. And again, like we said, early stage is great, middle stage gets a little bit more complicated, but still doable. Want to most likely avoid travel during late stage dementia. And how well does your loved one do in crowds, loud or confusing situations, as I just mentioned? Is the trip worth it? So if it's a bucket list trip, for instance, and this was one of the trips I took with my mother. So as much as we traveled around the world, as much as she traveled on her own, the one trip she wanted to take was to Australia and New Zealand, and she had not done that uh, at the time she was diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's. I was not going to let my mom pass away without taking her bucket list trip. So I took her to Australia and New Zealand in 2010 when she was in middle stage dementia, Alzheimer's, which we'll talk about that throughout this lesson. And um, it was challenging. There's no question about it. It was a rough trip. But looking back now, it was a delightful trip. At the time, a eh, little rough. If it's a bucket list trip, certainly. If it's a family gathering, absolutely. Those trips are worth it. If it's just for fun and your loved one might not be in the, you know, a good stage to travel, you might want to avoid travel. So also, where are you going and how will you get there? So flying can be very hectic and unpredictable. So driving has more flexibility and might be a better option for you. Also familiar places or places that you may have traveled to before can be a good idea as well because there might be some recognizability there. And also traveling to places where you can keep your daily routine are a good idea. One thing you can consider before taking a trip is doing a staycation. And how you can do this is you can just book a hotel room for a couple of nights in your hometown and you can go out and drive around and do some sightseeing, maybe go to some gardens, botanical gardens, or go to a an apple orchard and just spend the day doing a few things and have all your meals out and stay there for a couple of days and see how it goes for the two of you. And that might give you a better assessment if your loved one is ready to travel. And one that is often overlooked is how are you coping with their symptoms, right? So how are you dealing with your loved one's symptoms and limitations? And if you're doing pretty well and you're coping pretty well and you're not finding yourself frustrated or having anxiety around that, then you're probably in good shape to take a trip with your loved one. But if you are dealing with new symptoms, right? If new symptoms are starting to come up, you might want to hold off on taking a trip for a bit. You've assessed everything and you decided we're taking a trip. So what are the first steps in planning your trip? The first thing you wanna do is talk to your doctor and ensure you have enough medications to cover you while you're traveling. Also, you wanna keep your travel direct and that's pretty straightforward, right? We already said that driving has a lot more flexibility, so you may wanna consider a road trip rather than actually going to the airport. And if you do decide to plan an airplane trip, avoid long plane rides. Now, four hours maximum for a plane trip is generally a good guideline, but that also depends on your loved one, right? After you assess where they are and their stages and their limitations. 
You also want to avoid any kind of long layovers. And again, try not to have stopovers within your trip. Try to get a direct flight, right? From like Detroit to wherever, one stop and avoiding long layovers because that can be, that can add another layer of complexity to your trip that you might, you want to avoid, not might, you want to avoid. And plan travel so you can keep your routines as best you can. And here's where I made this mistake. It wasn't a mistake, but like I said, it was a bucket list trip. So just looking at this, 18 hour flight, didn't follow the four, four hour max rule, and we were in a completely different time zone, essentially upside down and backwards, literally in Australia. So it was really difficult to keep the routines as they are here at home. So you can imagine how that trip started out. <laughs> also, let the airline know that you're traveling with a loved one with dementia. So I would definitely uh, talk to the airline when you're booking your flight, mention that. They can put that in your passenger record. And also when you get to the airport, uh, let the staff know that you're traveling with someone with dementia because often they'll let you board earlier, which is a great idea. So you have more time to kind of maneuver, get yourself situated, and um, you don't have all the people around you while you're boarding the airplane. Now, when you're booking, Book a bulkhead seat, which are those uh, that first row um, from between first class and coach, so you have more leg room there. Or if you're uh, an exit row, might be an option, and this also depends on the stage that your loved one is in. But exit rows always have a lot more uh, leg room, and they're a great option uh, for the two of you for travel. Also, if you need a wheelchair, you're going to want to let the airline know again when you're booking, and also when you get to the airport. So when you're choosing your accommodations, you want to definitely take some things into consideration. So book a larger room if available. Now, often you can just ask for a handicap room because those are larger and they do have the bathrooms that are kind of the all-in-one. So if showering is an issue, this will make it much easier for you for um, bathing and showering and things like that. Get a lower floor and also avoid rooms with sliding glass doors. Now this is for obvious reasons, right? I don't need to go into that. Um, and also consider a door alarm or a child-proof doorknob to prevent wandering. Bed and breakfast or Airbnbs can be nice because they, they are more of a, a home-like environment. Now, this is more recommended for people that are in early stage or maybe early mid-stage. Um, it's, it's just a, it's a nice environment. And if, you're, if your loved one does uh, enjoy socializing, especially at a bed and breakfast type situation with other people, this can be a good option. But again, if they have a tendency to have outbursts or emotional outbursts, it might not be a good idea. So what to pack? Number one thing is you want to pack lightly for sure. Um, you want to pack clothes that are interchangeable and can be easily layered. And plan to do laundry on your trip. So just like I said, pack lightly and hotels always have laundry rooms, most of them. So you can just do a quick load of laundry or you can send it out to the hotel or you could go to a laundromat. That was one of the best things I did on our trip. Again, it was a long trip. We were gone for three weeks. So we packed very lightly and we just did laundry, you know, every three days or four days um, on our trip. And it was, it worked out beautifully and it just makes things a lot easier. And you should do all the packing. Um, and that's both before the trip and during the trip. So if you're moving around from place to place, um, which we did on our trip, which I don't re recommend, just FYI, um, you're gonna wanna do all the packing because that can be very confusing for your loved one and very upsetting, you know, just trying to figure out and you know, unpacking and packing can just lead to a whole host of problems. So just take control, pack everything for both you and your loved one. You want to pack night lights so you are able to create a, a lit path to the bathroom wherever you're staying. And bring a couple comfort items that your loved one enjoys. So maybe it's a favorite jacket or aromatherapy. If they enjoy that, bring that for them. Headphones and music are always a nice option. Or books or magazines, also things to keep them entertained. Also pack a small carry-on, right? So if you see this picture over here, this small roll-on carry-on right here is terrific. Um, I know a lot of people like to carry totes and things like this, but this is great because you don't have to have anything on your, your shoulder and it just is easy to wheel around and you can snap it onto your um, other luggage that you might be taking with you. So invest in one of these, they're terrific. So what you wanna pack are snacks, meds, furniture protectors, right? Especially if your loved one tends to have some incontinence issues a change of clothes for your loved one for sure. 
pack a small blanket and one of those nice head pillows for your loved one um, because we do know they tend to sleep often so when they take a little rest period on the plane it'd be nice for them to be kind of cozy and have a place to like lay on their head and neck and also bring games headphones magazines or any other activities that your loved one enjoys to help you if they become agitated and you also want to pack wipes and to to manage spills and also get yourself one of those little bottles of stain remover to bring with you it's you, you're definitely going to want to have both of those with you no doubt and then pack extra briefs if necessary and what i would do is even if you're doing a road trip still pack a smaller bag and this can certainly be a tote you don't have to do the roll-on bag um, to keep all these things uh, easily accessible to you while you're traveling so other considerations make sure your loved one has an id bracelet and other forms of id and then have your contact info with your loved one's identification right and then you might want to consider getting a wearable GPS unit just in case the two of you get separated, especially if you're going to be traveling to a busy area like a cosmopolitan, more urban environment. Consider printing the dementia business cards. They're actually in the downloads here, so you can download it and have some printed out at Kinko's or something like that and carry those with you. They say, please be patient. My loved one has dementia. And you can hand those out to people while you're out to dinner or to the flight attendant staff or you know airline staff so that people understand that your loved one uh, has dementia. For women, uh, consider eliminating a purse altogether. And if they will not give up their purse, consider getting a crossbody type purse, which you'll see there's a, a photo down here on the uh, slide presentation. And we also have this available in our store for you. And I think it's like $17 and it comes in a lot of different colors. And the reason I say this is because this is just from my own experience with my mom is that she, she just leave her purse everywhere, right? But it was something that was meaningful to her and a, a, you know, a safety kind of thing to her. So she always wanted to have her purse. So what I did is uh, I got a crossbody and just put some fake money in it and a little bit of real money because she really couldn't tell the difference because she wanted to have money. And I put her ID in there, of course, and um, her cell phone, which we lost a couple of times on that trip too, but <laughs> it was fine. Um, but it is just much easier if you can just eliminate that altogether for sure. Like I said, keep ID in purse at all times, keep minimal items in the purse. And the number one thing you want to do is you want to prepare yourself and rest up for this trip because you're going to need it. There's going to be a lot of things going on and there's going to be challenges and just the trip itself getting there will be an adventure in itself. So rest up and uh, be ready. So we're ready to go. You're hitting the road. What's next? So keep your morning routine as best you can the day of the trip. So like the breakfast thing and the meds and getting up at the same time, if it's possible, if you planned your trip out that way. If you're traveling by plane, arrive at the airport early enough to have at least 20 to 30 minutes to relax, right? Just to get used to this environment and not just go from like parking the car to rushing to security to rushing out of the airplane. Just Try to have enough time to ease into this whole travel program. Check your bags for sure so you don't have to lug them around the airport and check them with the sky cap if they're available. So the sky cap um, folks, if you're unfamiliar with them, are the, the, the uh, men and women that are outside the airport that will check your bags for you. And it's so much easier. There's generally not a long line. You just give them a couple bucks for a tip and you're on your way. Use the restroom before boarding, of course. And then board early. Like I said earlier, let the staff know that you're traveling with a loved one with dementia and you can board um, earlier during the pre-boarding um, time. Important to keep your loved one hydrated on the plane. So we just become more dehydrated naturally on an airplane. So you might wanna ramp up the water and take just a little bit more than normal while you're on the airplane and traveling. Accompany your loved one to the restroom on the airplane. Now. If it is a struggle for them to use a restroom, especially in this tiny environment. What I've done in the past when I traveled with my mom and I have the flight attendants help me is uh, hold up a blanket, like open the door all the way in the bathroom and hold up a blanket so that your loved one has more room to maneuver around and gives them the privacy that they need. And generally the flight attendants will help you out on that. And then you can go around the blanket and help your loved one as necessary. Use barf bags. And I'm telling you, this is a good one. Flight attendants appreciate it for all your garbage. So any wipes that you're using or Kleenexes, uh, any of that kind of stuff 
food wrappers, put them in, grab that little barf bag that's in that seat pocket in front of you and put all your garbage in there and then give that to the flight attendant to throw away or throw away yourself. The worst thing you can do is hand your garbage to the flight attendants, just yeah, giving it to them. Don't do that. And if you are doing this stuff, then they're gonna be a lot nicer to you and gonna help you out if you need help with your loved one for sure, trust me. And tell a flight attendant your loved one has dementia just in case you doze off during the trip. Now, this is something that I did um, for sure. I talked to the flight attendant and said, hey, my mom's got you know Alzheimer's. If I fall asleep, keep an eye on her. If she starts getting up and doing stuff, wake me up and, and let me know. And um, they, they did have to do that a couple of times on this trip. And again, it was a long trip, 18 hours. So get them on your side, especially if you're making a longer trip. Tips for while you're on your trip. So you've got to your destination, everything's good, what's next? So as I keep saying, keep your routines as best as possible, so important. The more you can do this, the more enjoyable it's gonna be for the both of you. And start slow with activity. So you don't wanna overwhelm your loved one on your first day at your new location. So just maybe one activity to kind of ease into things and, and see how that goes and kind of build on that as you uh, plan out the rest of your trip. And you wanna plan breaks throughout the day, right? So you just wanna be, don't wanna be go, 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 go during your trip. So plan some nice breaks, maybe have like a little snack at a park or you know, just kind of sit and enjoy um, something, uh, some sort of scenery and just relax, right? So take good, you know, five, 10 minute breaks throughout the day. So it's just, a, it's a nice comfortable pace for both you and your loved one. So one thing you wanna consider when dining out, go to restaurants that are smaller and certainly less noisy places. So big, loud places are just, can be overwhelming for your loved one and honestly for you too. So find the cozy little, you know, local restaurants and um, that are, are nice or maybe have a nice outdoor patio or something like that. So like I said earlier, if you're moving from place to place and, and you know, going to different locations during your trip, do all the packing and keep that well-lit path to the bathroom and leave the light on in the bathroom all night long. One great thing to do is video your trip. I did this for the bucket list trip to Australia. I, I have, I think 331 videos, little snippets of stuff. Um, so I video, videotaped the entire thing with just a little flip share uh, video camera. I mean, this was back in 2010. So that's, that's what I had at the time. My phone at that time did not have a very good video. I don't even know if it had video to be honest with you, just photo maybe. And so I, I videotaped the whole thing and, and made some like little mini uh, recaps of all of our, of our entire trip. And it's really nice for one, to look back with your loved one. They may or may not remember some things, but you know, they'll remember the emotion that they felt. They'll remember how they, they felt during that activity or during that dinner or whatever. And you'll see their response as they look at these videos and it's just, it's delightful. So even if you had all this frustration during your trip, you get video, you get on video all the lovely times and you look back together and it's really delightful. And it erases all that yuck that you might've had on the trip. And again, they're gonna remember how they felt. They might not remember that they were in Sydney, Australia, but they'll remember how they felt during that trip. And it's a great thing for you to look back on once they're gone. I mean, I love looking at these videos and hearing my mom's voice and, and reminiscing about the things that we did together on that trip. And, and sadly, that, that was her very last trip that she took because she passed away uh, three years later. Have a plan B, definitely, because things are probably gonna go sideways at some point. Hopefully they won't, but if they do, have a plan B in your pocket. So you wanna be prepared for hiccups and be flexible with your loved one. Patients are definitely gonna be key here. So you're gonna have to pull out those patients and just ugh, bring it forward, right? And have that flexibility too. Have an alternate plan in mind, right? So you might need to stay a day later or longer, or you might need to cut your trip short. There were many times on this trip, again, it was three weeks that I wanted to cut it short. And I called my dad, I'm like, ah, oh, look, I'm gonna send her home on a plane to San Francisco and you're gonna have to come pick her up, right? I didn't do that. He's like, take a deep breath and go for a walk and I'll get into that later too. And, um, and, and it's, you know, it's all gonna work out. And it, and it did, but he was willing to, he was willing to come and get her. Uh, consider purchasing travel insurance. This might be a good idea for you for sure. And then 
Just as I said, have someone that's willing to take over should you become ill or need extra help. Just like I was saying with my dad, like he said, if things become too much, I'll come get her and meet her and you can continue on your trip if you want to keep traveling. He's a good dad. The bottom line is, remember you're creating an experience for your loved one, an experience, right? They're not going to remember a lot of this stuff, if anything. It's the experience and how you reacted with them during this trip, right? And you're creating memories for yourself. So all of this, it's, it's, it's not necessarily about the destination and, and how long you're out and how long you're doing something. It's, it's about the journey, right? Everything's about the journey with this with dementia and Alzheimer's. And it's the same thing with travel. Take care of yourself and keep your routines as best as possible. Exercise. I can't tell you enough if you, and I don't mean like, you know, getting up and doing aerobics class, just a simple walk, right? Getting out and moving your body. You guys know that I talk about that all the time. I'm a big proponent of exercise and just moving. It clears your mind. It reduces your stress level. And if you can take 30 minutes to yourself during your trip, it will do wonders for you. And this is from personal experience, right? I had to take a walk every day, a walk minimally for 30 minutes just to, to get away, regroup, and come back and be ready and happy and have that give my mom that great experience, right? And the nice thing about the bed and breakfast thing, because we did stay at a couple of those, um, you can ask nicely or bribe with a bottle of wine or something, the innkeeper to keep an eye on your loved one while you go out for a you know, 20, 30 minute walk, which is what I did. And they were wonderful. They were completely willing to do it. You know, a couple sat down and played cards with my mom while I could go out and go for a run or do something. And that was nice because then I could be out for a little longer, right? I could go like for maybe 45 minutes and just, and just go. Um, so if you can do that, you know, try and keep up some level of activity while you're on your uh, trip. Like I said, it's important to keep yourself in tip top shape mentally and physically while you're traveling and enjoy yourself bottom line even in the frustrating moments right keep in mind you're creating experience and they're going to remember how you made them feel on this trip so you're creating an experience and try and have a good time even though there might be times you're like Ugh. right time heals all wounds and trust me this is from my own personal experience you know when i <laughs> when i dropped my mom off at the airport after that trip there was no like hey great trip love you blah 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 well, i did tell her i loved her but i was like you know, I was more like, dad, I put her in the car, shut the, do shut the door and said, bye. <laughs> Just needed to go home and sit by myself for like a day and not move. <laughs> but now, you know, she's been, that trip was in 2010. So that was 10 years ago. I don't remember any of the frustrating stuff. I don't remember any of the bad stuff. I don't remember when I was ready to like, ugh beat my head against the wall all the time and lay on the floor and cry and all that. I don't remember any of that. All of that's gone. The only thing that I remember is the beautiful, lovely moments that we had together. So time does heal all wounds. Now, if your loved one cannot travel, there are some options for you. Utilize technology. For example, if your uh, family is having a wedding or friends having a wedding, you can arrange video chats ahead of time so your loved one can talk to the bride and groom or to some guests and be interactive that way and or you could have someone stream uh, live stream the, the wedding so that they can participate in that way virtual travel there's a lot of this uh, right now so Condé Nast travel in particular has all kinds of virtual travel on their website everything from hikes in the park to going to museums around the world so you can and they're all video so you can sit down and do like a little uh, virtual travel this way Zoom and FaceTime get-togethers. Everyone's doing this right now. It's a great way to connect with people. You could even have a Zoom dinner together, so with family. And a fun thing to do, and I used to do this with my mother, is recreate a trip that you enjoyed together at home over a weekend, right? So let's go to Paris or Italy. And a great way to accomplish this is to create a playlist of, you know, kind of French music or Italian music or wherever you decide to go. Make a menu and dinner of regional foods, so French food or Italian food. Italian's very easy, so that might be a fun one. And watch a movie about the destination, and voila, you've got a little virtual trip right there that you both can enjoy. What does this mean too? Like, this does not mean that you can't travel alone. If your loved one can't travel, you still can go out and, 
and do some traveling on your own. And it's definitely, uh, I definitely encourage that. So see if a, a family member or a friend can help you out and watch your loved one, or maybe um, get some in-home help for a couple days that can stay with your loved one, or maybe get a short respite, respite care at a memory care facility or assisted living and take a short three-day trip by yourself. And it's completely rejuvenating. You can come back fresh and ready to go and um, embrace your loved one with dementia. And like I said, it might not be easy, the trip, and uh, but I will tell you, it's worth it. And this slide has some photos of my mom and I traveling together and a couple of them in uh, Australia, uh, the one there in the green t-shirt in front of that river, that was is one of my favorites. And that's when we were in Australia together. Uh, but I wouldn't trade that trip for anything. Uh, it, you know, she was my travel buddy and it's something that we, we enjoyed doing. I'm getting a little emotional that we enjoyed doing uh, quite a bit. And uh, I miss her. I miss my travel buddy. Uh, so highly recommend, again, early to mid-stage, uh, early mid-stage, I would say, uh, is a great time to travel and, and maybe not so much in late stage. So I'm going to end this uh, with a video that I told you I videotaped the trip um, of our little recap of Sydney. And I, I'm telling you, the video quality is not very good. It's not as good as these videos we're doing now. But you get the idea. And if you don't want to watch the whole thing, go to like 545, 530, I think it is. And you can hear my mom talk about her experience in Sydney and how I wanted to throw her to the wolves. <laughs> anyway, thanks. And uh, we will see you in the next lesson. We are down at the Sydney Opera House in front of us. Down at Circular Key. And coming up on the left is going to be the uh, Sydney Harbor Bridge, which was built in 1932. It actually is all lit up at night, which is actually quite spectacular. $3 toll. They call it the Old Coat Hanger. Sitting having a little glass of wine and a couple oysters here on the Sydney Harbor on Friday afternoon. Does it get any better than this? Beautiful day. Right on the water. Fantastic. This is the inside of the Queen Victoria building in Sydney big shopping center. This is the inside of that building I took a shot of last night outside of our hotel. Mom and I are having a cocktail on our at our bar at our hotel called Zeta. And it's voted most popular bar in Sydney, and it's got a fabulous cocktail list. It has about 32 signature cocktails, all different stuff. I'm getting a grilled pineapple and uh, something martini, and Mom's getting a black cherry amaretto martini. Here's our cocktails at the famous cocktail bar. I ended up getting grilled pineapple and pepper martini. There's Mom's black cherry. Amaretto martini. Yum. Cheers, mate. Mom's new haircut and a treatment for her hair that'll help keep it frizzy down. This was our splurge on our trip. Lovely. This is Paddington Markets in Paddington. Doing a little shopping on a Saturday afternoon. Big market. Here's mom in the winery, wine bar in Sydney, and it is packed out. Oh, it's somebody's birthday. Hey. It's like being at Denny's. Look 
Look at the girl in the hat. Notice. This is how they dress in Sydney. Check her out. She's got a pillbox little hat on. There you go. And then, oh, and then she's got a see-through top on with a black bra. Gotta love this town. Anyway, Mom, are you enjoying your lunch? Mom, are you enjoying your progressive dinner? We're actually doing progressive dinner. We're gonna go to another wine bar for this. We had a little starter and a glass of wine here. And we're moving on, but it's very cramped in furniture here, like the wine bar that we have. And so you can see, low tables, the same kind of thing. Everything's like piled on top of each other. Chandeliers over the bar, very cool. And uh, the Beach Boys were playing in the background. That'll love it. Okay, we'll see at the next one. When I discovered a Monica Lewinsky lookalike here as well. Check her out. For sure. Here's Mom at the uh, Millie Vanilli Wine Bar. That's not really not the name, but that's what everybody calls it. Here in Sydney. And we're just outside a very happening kind of festival going on. It's been going on all day. The same band's playing. You might be able to hear them in the background. They're right out there in the park. Kind of watched them for a while. It's fantastic. The city definitely has a pulse and a vibe. And the Sydney people, we decided, definitely know how to party. <laughs> they play hard and work hard. Work hard, play hard kind of program. Love it. We're going to go back out and listen to it a little bit. Here, Mom and I are at uh, Sydney Airport getting ready to head back to San Francisco and our flight is delayed, so we're going to spend the night in San Francisco. So we're hanging out here waiting. And uh, Mom's going to give us a little recap on her trip, what she liked best. Mom? Hi. Time has passed very quickly. <clears throat> Met a lot of people that could be great friends. And... So a lot of beautiful places, a lot of great food, had a really good time. Kim would like to throw me out to the wolves once in a while, but I managed to squeak through, so. <laughs> it worked out just funny. Bon voyage. Bon voyage. Mom wants a picture of her eating oysters even though they aren't raw. They're baked. So they're just like mussels, but she thinks she's hot stuff. I already had one. It was darn good. Yep. So I'm having a second one. Hopefully it'll be darn good too. I can't believe how good it is. It's very tasty if it's baked. We have to have a little bite of something because we've been here for five hours now trying to get on. Five hours trying to get on an airplane. Jaha, the joys of standby. Although it's the crew's fault. They needed more rest. Damn airplane pilots and flight attendants. Here she goes. Yeah. Mmm, look at her. Mmm, yummy. This tongue is very good. Okay. But it does taste like shallots or bacon. No, not the bacon part. Fish part. No. Mussels. Mussels. An awful lot like mussels. Exactly like mussels, as a matter of fact. We're spending the night in San Francisco tonight. We'll probably have more oysters when we get there, but I'll make her eat a raw one. <laughs> Bye! <Forget that. laughs>